And so the things that we do most is push people out. And, and when I say push people out, you can't keep them inside your four walls. You don't walls. mean push them out of the company. No, you we don't. You mean push them out into push an environment out into where they the, can be productive. Right. Yeah, the right. company invests. We invest in, I was invested in heavily when uh, my company decided to send me to the Harvard Advanced Management Program. Right. And so you separate yourself for three months and you go into these uh, very diverse uh, classrooms. We had 70% of the folks in the, in the program were from outside of the country. And you have these living groups where there's, you know, there's no desks, there's no, but you have to come up with solution, real world solutions. And um, when you come back, the company is, is waiting there to embrace you with a new opportunity. So the first thing they asked me to do when I came back was, they said, hey, just recreate the organization structure. Wow. And so there's a mandate to Yeah, that. yeah. I mean, you're, you're coming. I mean, there's, there's a huge investment, but you know you're being poured into in a way that you'll be able to repay the company. Um, and you want to repay the company because of that investment. And so we do that with our commercial mm -hmm. folks as well. We want to invest in them, but we want them to also understand that there's an expectation back, yeah. um, but it, there's a freedom yeah. that comes with it. Right. And I think that when I say we push them out, I think that freedom is, is built into. Yeah, it's also that when you push them out, you're pushing them into environments that disrupt their patterns and habits of thinking. That's right. right? It's a disruptive kind of environment in a positive sense yeah. that it opens you up to a different kind of learning. So this will get to be my last question. Then I'm going to invite all of you to take, after I ask this last question, to take two minutes to talk to each other and see if you can generate a one-sentence question you would like to ask either one or both of us. But I'm going to ask Brett this one last question first. I just wanted to warn you guys. So if there was one piece of advice you could give t to teachers, thinking back about your own children's experience, your experience, connecting that with what Duke is looking to in the future. One thing you would most like to see teachers be doing, start doing, stop doing, do differently. One thing. One thing, um, and, and I will say, just like I said before, getting the children out of the classroom. Huh. Uh, if it's not interactive, it's, it's probably just not as powerful. But, getting the children outside of the, the box that they're in. And, and there are other ways to do that. Uh, yeah. The new technology of seeing the smart boards used effectively can take a child from a classroom to another country. Um, but our kids are exposed to so much and they have access to so much information and so many tools that if the classroom is not uh, exciting to them anymore, uh, then I think we have a chance of losing some of that innovation mm -hmm. and, and uh, creativity that, that we want in our next It's interesting. Generation. You put that at almost a higher level than the technical, I, or that I it's did. the best way to learn the technical. I, I totally, totally agree. I, you know, I don't think, uh, I, I just don't think my, my daughter would be going off to Carnegie Mellon in the fall if, if she would have just stayed in the classroom. Right. Um, but we purposed uh, her to get outside of the four walls and she's travels she travels with the school mm -hmm. uh, you know we're booster parents and so we you know we're always trying to create an environment where uh, the kids get to experience things outside of the four walls of the classroom that's great okay at your tables turn to a neighbor you have two minutes to develop a one sentence powerful question that's great that's Thank great you. excellent excellent perfect well, you're good. You're, you're right up. Your writings are phenomenal. <laughs>
Let me interrupt again, please. There are two mics, I believe, that will circulate. If you raise your hand, there's one mic there, there's one mic there, raise your hand, and the mic nearest will come to you. Please try to ask your question in one sentence and address it to one or the other or both of us. Thanks. Questions, comments? You could also make a comment, but only one sentence. All right. All right, I've, I've got a question. Now, I know you're not in finance, and I'm not sure how much Duke Energy is involved in the financial industry, and I'm really impressed by you know, how you're <laughs> innovatively trying to be an energy company in the 21st century and transform yourself. But I'd like to ask a question about the economic crisis itself, the recession. In what ways do you think conventional thinking led the entire financial system sort of off the cliff? Someone didn't recognize the the sort of over-speculation. Someone didn't recognize a financial panic. In what ways could innovative thinking that you're talking about have been a better, um, that more economists could have been doing this kind of interview? I'm going to give Brett a minute on this one while I try to take a crack at this question. Because <laughs> I, I think it's an important one and a hard one. I, do too. I mean, I, some yeah. people could say it is innovation in the financial sector that got us into all this trouble. And I think there's something to be said for that. So is, when we think about innovation, it can't be the Wild West. It can't be innovation without some understanding of what is social value, what is okay and not okay, without some degree of regulation, in effect. We need that. But I'm going to take it a step further, because I believe that while the financial institutions acted irresponsibly, uh, there was a deeper problem. There is a deeper problem. More than 70% of the American economy is based on consumer spending. Did you know that? I didn't know that until I started working on this book, 70%. Yep. And that that consumer spending has been, for the last 20 years, increasingly fueled by people going into debt, leading me to worry that we've created an economy based on people spending money they do not have, because the banks let them, to buy things they may not need, threatening the planet in the process. And so for me, this becomes the even more compelling case to create young people who are innovation ready, not merely college ready, but innovation ready, capable of innovating, to create an economy based on more young people creating more new ideas to solve more different kinds of problems. So that's, that's my view on the financial crisis, and I think it's, an, it's a valid point. Not all innovation is wonderful. Brett, you gonna take a well, shot at that? I, you know, I'll, I'll say that I think part of it was, is just our desire for immediate self-gratification. Right. Um, you know, if we can uh, uh, create a million dollars for ourselves in, in a month versus over the course of three years, then we're going to try and, and do it. I, I think, too, that if you look at our, and I, I alluded to this earlier, the way that we apply resources uh, in this country are, uh, I'll, I'll just say they're flip-flopped. I think they're in the wrong direction. If we truly want our country to be in a leadership position, we have to rethink how we pay our teachers um, in order to in order to create in order to create the, the value in our students, and we have to invest there heavily because if that's truly our future, that's one thing. But I also look at, at, at government oversight. Um, you've got the most innovative and creative and talented people in the financial sector. Uh, and then our, the government oversight is made up of whoever's left. <laughs> and, and again, I think there's a, there's a misappropriation of Talent. resources. Yeah. Um, if, if we're going to have a complex global economy, we also have to have the appropriate oversight and the appropriate talent to, man, you know, to manage these wizards uh, that are creating uh, credit default swaps and every other type of, of new tool. So I, I just I have to go back to the fact that we're not, we're not putting the dollars where we need them the most for the long-term viability of our, of our country right now. Well said. More questions? Can you talk a little bit more about um, in your research and in your travels and talking to people in the business sector about the change that's going on in teacher prep at the university level, mm. our leadership and principal and administration prep? <laughs> Is that changing so that we're focusing um, 
innovatively when they're coming out of their programs? No, it's uh, not. Next question. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm only playing with you, but it's, uh, it pains me. Honestly, it pains me to see the lack of innovation in education, the lack, the ways in which so many of these education degree programs are considered cash cows by their universities. And or we're not, you know, you contrast what we do with Finland. Finland's the highest performing education system in the world. It's also a country higher on the innovation and entrepreneurship economic index than That's is right. even our country. Right. And what have they done that's dramatically different? They've totally transformed the selection and preparation of teachers. They don't nece necessarily pay them a lot more, Brett, but they esteem them. Yeah. And the gaps between what they make versus what a physician or a lawyer makes is far less than it is in our country. But the main thing is every teacher has a master's degree, every teacher is deeply uh, expert in his or her subject, and they spend more than a year in the equivalent of a kind of medical residency model apprenticed to a master teacher. I saw better student teaching in those classrooms than I've seen in most American classrooms wow. with many veteran teachers because they get more feedback and they have better modeling. By the way, we, we did a documentary called The Finland Phenomenon that may interest you. It is interesting to me, finally, that the high-tech high school uh, network in San Diego, uh, about which I have written, is arguably one of the most innovative, along with New Tech, in the country, was so disappointed in the kinds of graduates it was seeing, even from our so-called best schools of ed, they have started their own graduate school of education. And if I were going tomorrow to be, uh, uh, to get a degree, I would go to High Tech High's graduate school of education. Very different. Wow. Time for a few more questions or comments. How do we move beyond a culture of compliance in our schools and our school systems? That's a really important question. I'm hoping Brett might have a thought on this, but I'll start. Um, I think we have to understand that there is no innovation without investment in R&D, research and development. Microsoft's R&D budget is 13%. Cisco's is 17%. Be interested to know what Duke's is. 3M has a 6% R&D budget. They're a manufacturing company. Where is our R&D budget? Where is it? We don't have one. Even the so-called I3 grants out of Department of Education have nothing to do with real R&D and innovation. So if we want change, if we want innovation, we have to create R&D funding that incents the risk takers and the early adopters in our education system. We need laboratory schools. This is one reason I love to come back to North Carolina, because I think the New Schools Project has been so instrumental in creating models of 21st century schools that are in effect lab schools. But we need to do that at a much more of a scale and so that people understand that a compliance-based system will never innovate. And without innovation, without lab schools, we will never create the schools that our kids want and that our country needs. Well, I'll tell you, I, 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 love, I love the, uh, I visited the uh, colleges that are now uh, adopting the programs for the high school students to come in I'm looking at graduation rates that are 96 to 99 percent um, versus. You mean the early college high schools? Yeah, the about? early yeah. college Those high schools. Those are great, aren't they? That's and a very good innovation. North Carolina has been the leader in beautiful that. Beautiful innovation. Absolutely. I, I, think that, I think that that's cutting edge. I also believe that we have to step up the private public partnership uh, because I truly believe that business has more of a uh, vested interest 